he falls in love with a lesser fairy. So the lesser fairies are not, I guess they're not as human as the high fae are. Like the high fae are basically just big humans with giant cocks and balls and huge cavernous vaginal holes. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Nada and today I am bringing you yet another review of the A Court of Thorns and Roses book series. I never thought that I would be sitting here in this moment filming this video. I attempted to read Akatar, the first book, when I was in college. One of my friends very kindly lent me her copy and I could not get past, I think maybe the second or third chapter, whenever the main character like ends up leaving her family home and going to live with the fairies, that was when I yeeted myself out of the book because I was like, the way this is written, I can't, I can't do it, I can't do it. But a mixture of curiosity and boredom has sent me down a path of no return where I am currently reading every book in the Accord of Thorns and Roses series and I figured if I'm going to be subjected to this torture I may as well make a video about it. If you like videos about books, tv, movies, really any kind of media or just anything that I feel like talking about at that time, please subscribe to this channel. I am aiming to put out videos every Sunday. I'm a busy girl, but I'm going to try and keep this promise to myself. So if you want to see this face on Sundays, hit that subscribe button down below. And we're just going to go ahead and get right into this. I know there's a lot of people, I know there's a lot of people who really love the A Court of Thorns and Roses series and this video is absolutely no shade to any of those people. It is, however, shade to Sarah J. Maas. I want you to know, hey Sarah, I want you to know that if I ever see you in In order to aid me in reviewing the plot of the first two books of these series, I have the beautiful blood of Christ to thank. Have, has anybody ever thought about how gruesome of a religion Catholicism is? Like, they were like, yeah, we're going to eat flesh and drink blood on a daily to weekly basis. That should really sell people on the whole Christ thing. That should, that should really make them come over to our side. I mean, between that and the centuries of corruption, I'm surprised the Protestant Reformation didn't happen sooner. Oh dear God, the wine has hit. But anyways, we're going to get right into talking about quite possibly one of the worst book series that I've ever been subjected to in my entire life. By subjected to I do mean I subjected myself to it, but I would like somebody to, um, I would like to, to make this misery collective, you know? We're going, without further ado, we are going to get right into Court of Thorns and Redcons. So, this series follows a young woman named Katniss Everdeen. I mean, her name is Feyre. I call her Katniss, however, because, um, the entire beginning portion of this book is essentially just the first quarter of the Hunger Games where Katniss is like hunting in the wilderness. And I feel like people don't talk about this enough. Like this book series, to me at least, and my friend who recommended that I read this book series can attest to all of the unhinged texts that I've sent them over the past couple of weeks. Like it is essentially just a hodgepodge of several different key millennial novels like and series that at in some ways, we're more successful at doing what this book is trying to do. And in some ways, we're a lot less successful in doing what this book is trying to do. But basically, Feyre to me is like essentially a Katniss Everdeen cipher in that she is nothing, means nothing, has no real development, basically just exists to be a camera lens through which the audience can view the action around her. And then at some point, 
juncture. She's like instigated into taking action herself. But even in taking action, she's weirdly inactive. We'll get into it later. Um, Basically, she's not inactive. She's just like not smart. But again, we'll get into it later. So we're just going to hop right into the plot of the first book, A Court of Thorns and Roses. We open this book with Feyre, the main character, hunting in the wilderness to support her starving family. It's been a particularly difficult winter and the family is on the brink of starving to death. Feyre is pretty much the breadwinner for the entire family. She's the one who goes out and hunts, um, who sells some of the meat that she gets or the skins or furs that she gets while she's hunting while her two sisters Nesta and Elaine and her father sit at home and do nothing basically. Her father sometimes makes like carved wooden sculptures and tries to sell those for pennies but it doesn't really get the family anything. So Feyre after making a promise to her mother when her mother was on her deathbed is basically at the age of 11, put in charge of caring for a family of four on her own. The family has come upon hard times, basically. Her father was a merchant who, like, lost all of his money on a bad investment and ended up getting his um, legs broken by, I guess, some of his investors or, like, a loan shark or something and can't really do anything anymore. And, like I said, Feyre is in charge of the household. So we start the book she's go we understand the baseline she lives in this very poor village in like a two-room cottage she shares a bed with her two sisters Um, her dad sleeps in the living room on the floor i assume and they're just living a very miserable subsistent existence they're all very thin on the brink of starvation Feyre ventures into the wilderness to see if she can hunt anything for her family to eat. And this is where I say that this book series really feels like the Hunger Games to me because it's a pretty much a similar conceit, like dead, one of the parents is dead, um, has ostensibly charged one of their children with taking responsibility for the family before their time. And they hunt in order to provide for their family. Like, Katniss Everdeen hunts squirrels and shit to feed her family and Feyre hunts everything else to feed her family. So she's and it's a very similar like in the way that the books are written very like sparse prose the even the description of the place that they live in it could be District 12 reasonably in my opinion. Um, But Feyre goes into the woods and she spots a deer that she's getting ready to kill. But then there's a big wolf behind the deer and the wolf is coming to eat the deer. And this is a world we learn over the course of the first couple of chapters where fairies and humans live parallel to one another. They don't cross paths. They pretty much stay in their own respective worlds. And fairies are basically like the overlords to humans, as far as I can understand from the first book. Fairies are like in charge of everything. They kill humans at their leisure. I guess they like eat, torture, do whatever they want to humans, basically. Or they did do whatever they wanted to humans before there was some big war that I don't really know the details about. (laughs) that ended with a truce and a wall being built that separates the fairy world from the human world. So the fairies, a lot of them can shapeshift, become different species or take on different faces. They sometimes are able to... Uh, oh, so like the 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 humans have a lot of folktales about these fairies. They can't lie. They are, they're like Achilles heel is ash, wood and iron. Um, There's all of these ideas that the humans have about the fairies. And I think I said this earlier, some of the humans worship the fairies, but Feyre hates the fairies because she blames the fairies or the fairies like live in luxury and joy while her and her family languish in this tiny little village, whatever. So she's in the wilderness. She sees this big wolf coming up behind the deer and she's like, (laughs) that's my dinner. I need that to feed my family. There is a chance, however, that this wolf is not really a wolf, but a fairy. 
And like I said, because fairies can shapeshift and whatever, and it's like a little bit too big to be a normal wolf. So she's like, honestly, I'm going to just have to take that chance because I need to feed this. I need to feed these motherfuckers. We're all starving. Or she kills the wolf first. I actually don't remember. She kills them both. They both die. She skins the wolf and uses its pelt for warmth. She's basically going to sell the pelt at the next um, market. And she brings the deer back to her house. Her family is so excited because the bitches are starving and the deer has enough meat for them to be able to eat for months. They can freeze some of it, dry some of it, make stews, all of this. Like they are set for a while. And this wolf pelt is probably going to get them a lot of money at the market. So it feels like things are looking up for the Feyres until... And if, one thing that I will say about this part of the book is that it it starts out very bleak, but then you feel the prose get a little bit lighter as the um like the the pressure starts to come off of favor because she's like, I did the thing that I needed to do. I secured us food for however long, and I'm really excited about how how much money I'm gonna get for this pelt. Like, ooh. some other things to know about Feyre, she likes to paint. She hunts. She hates fairies and she likes to paint. Those are her three personality traits. That's really all you have to hold on to. Oh, yeah. And she can't read because she was the youngest daughter of a noble family that fell out of favor right when she was at school age. So those are her four personality traits. Everything seems like it's looking up for Feyre until a big scary fairy comes knocking at the door and is like, hey, girl, you killed my friend Andrus and you're gonna have to pay for that with your life. There's basically some treaty between the humans and the fairies where like if a human kills a fairy, fairy then the human has to spend the rest of their life live ser in servitude to the fairies or whatever. And this is horrifying for Feyre and her family because as far as they know, the fairies are just like flesh eating monsters who hate humans and want to destroy all peace that humans have ever. So she is like, oh shit. I have to go live with this big, scary, kind of sexy fairy now. He might eat me. He might kill me. I miss my, I'm never going to see my family again. What's going to happen? Very, very scared, right? It's immediately confusing because she goes with the fairy into the wilderness to the fairy world where she has to be like um, kept and they're nice to her. They give her a bath. She gets really nice clothes. She's expecting to be like a slave, basically, like enslaved because humans used to be enslaved by fairies. But they're like feeding her delicious food and telling her she can go wherever she wants. She doesn't have to worry about anything. Oh, yeah. And the fairy reveals himself to be a fairy named Tamlin. And back at his castle, he's got a friend named Lucian and he's got a bunch he's got a servant who serves Feyre her name is Alice Alice is equally as skeptical of humans as Feyre is of fairies and for some reason they all wear masks she's not entirely sure why they're all wearing masks so there's like elements of mystery at the beginning of this book you know I really want to say that Sarah had me in the first half okay because after I got through the part of the book that I'd already read before that I was like oh I hate this I don't want to finish this once we got to the fairyland and I was like wait why are they being nice to her if they said that this is her punishment for murdering someone I was really confused by that I was really like stuck on that for the majority of reading this book because I was like why the fuck is he being nice to her like what's going on didn't she just kill his friend like what are we doing here so there's an element of mystery to what's going on in Feyre's life and as she gets to the fairy world and also an element of mystery to the fact that all of these fairies have masks on and it's just like not explained. Nobody really talks about it. So she's basically like expected to eat dinner with them every night, spend time with them. They start asking her weird questions like, have you ever been in love with someone? Is there anyone that you're interested in back home? Like, what's going on with that? And she's like, uh, why are you trying to be friends with me? Like, you're fairies. I'm a human. We're supposed to hate each other. Like, mortal enemy species. What's going on here? There, it's clear that there's something that's being hidden from her throughout this entire, like, first portion of the book, but she can't exactly figure out what it is. A lot happens and, like, nothing happens. <laughs> a 
over the course of this book. She is basically like getting to know her new home, learning about all of the fairies and beasts that live in the fairylands of Prithian, which is where Tamlin, his friend Lucian, and all of their merry um, band are from. We learn that Tamlin is the High Lord of Spring in Prithian. So there are several different courts, I think seven of them, in Prithian. And they all have different High Lords, people who are in charge of things, their own um, traditions based off of what the court is. So there's the Court of Spring, Summer, Fall, Winter, and then there's the Solar Courts, which are Day, Night, and Dawn. What does this mean? We don't know. Because we don't really get to see any of these people in the first book. Like, it, we know they're out there. They exist. But the only person we meet in the first book is the High Lord of the Night. The only person that we clearly meet in the first book is the High Lord of Night, Resand. I don't know what his last name is. I don't even know if he has a last name. It's like, let's let's get some of the, the housekeeping out of the way. Resand is the High Lord of Night. But I also want to talk about my fave. <laughs> Lucian, the, the youngest son of the High Lord of the Autumn Court. Sorry, you make me so excited. So especially in the first book, Lucian is like so fun and so funny. He's the guy that like comes in to break the tension. He's always there to tell a joke. He is, I don't know, he's just kind of like the court jester of the first book. And he is able to befriend Feyre sooner than Tamlin is able to befriend Feyre. I guess because he's like kind of not really in a position of power in the court. He basically lives with Tamlin because Tamlin is his friend and his family. He was like in love with a human, I think. Okay, okay. He was in love. With, so there's like hierarchies in this fairy world and racism, both real red-blooded American racism and species racism, but we'll get into that later. He fell in love with a lesser fairy. Lesser, There's high fae, regular fairies, and then lesser fairies. He falls in love with a lesser fairy. So the lesser fairies are not I guess they're not as human as the high fae are. Like the high fae are basically just big humans with giant cocks and balls and huge cavernous vaginal holes but so the yeah the high fair are basically just people but the lesser fairies can kind of like look like whatever like alice is a lesser fairy and she kind of looks like a tree <laughs> so lucian falls in love with a lesser fairy and that's not acceptable for a son of the high lord of the autumn court and the autumn court is a crazy fiery evil place where people jockey for power he's got like 18 brothers whatever the fuck his brothers like murder the love of his life in front of him and then and he's like i gotta get out of (laughs) here i shouldn't stay here like they whoever's gonna succeed our dad our dad is already bad enough whoever's gonna succeed him is gonna be just as bad as him i'm gonna go live with my friend tamlin in the spring court so his position is always a little bit precarious he kind of doesn't want to like push the boundaries too much because he doesn't really have a home he can't really go back to the autumn court he's not really at home in the spring court like tamlin is his friend but tamlin is also his boss so it's a very murky area for him that's also kind of why i love him because he doesn't have any of the like aggressive authority that tamlin has he's just kind of like a dude hanging out at his friend's house. That's Lucian. And then the other person that we meet is Resand, the High Lord of the Night Court. We meet him at this ceremony called Kalanme, which is some spring court bullshit that is important to them. I think it's like a mating ceremony or something. Like Tamlin has to go really aggressively fuck another fairy in order to preserve his powers or something like that. It's not well explained. Feyre is not supposed to go because she's human. And this is the night where the girls get wild. They get crazy. It's basically like Midsummer from like antiquity. So think Bacchanals for Dionysus, where people would absolutely get absolutely shit faced and just like not everyone touching on everyone doing every drug in existence rubbing all up on people naked whatever 
you can do to bring in the spring. So Feyre is not supposed to go because it's very dangerous. And the fairies are kind of just, if you want to think about like a modern metaphor, or like a modern linkage, you could think about like carnival in some places is still a very wild party. So that's Cal and Mai. Feyre is not supposed to go because she's human and she'll basically like get destroyed. But she's of course like, why the f- would I stay home where it's safe? Let me go into the street, into the wilderness where I might be ripped to shreds by the creatures that I've been afraid of this entire time. And she ventures out into the woods and is promptly cornered by three lesser fairies who, it is insinuated, want to sexually f- her. Um, right before that's about to happen, Resand, the High Lord of the Night Court, pops up out of nowhere and it's like oh my god thank you guys so much for finding her for me so excited that i get to hang out with my girl and it's basically insinuated that she's like his human concubine or whatever like that's what the the lesser fairy think they immediately have some weird tension between them because she's like who the fuck is this guy just like coming out of nowhere but also thank god he saved me because i probably would have died just there and he basically i don't remember exactly what happens but they're just like bantering or whatever and he basically is like go home you stupid bitch oh no that's lucian lucian comes out and he's like why the fuck are you here like this is not this is not the night for you to be playing games this is not the night for you to be running around exploring trying to learn what fairies are like you are a human you will die so lucian takes Feyre back home and she's like oh my god what does he mean that like it's not safe and that the tamlin i think i know is gone i need to find out so Basically, Tamlin comes home from Cal and Mai. She's figured out by this point that it's some sort of aggressive mating ritual. And he comes home and he's DTF. <laughs> like, he's looking for it from Feyre. And he's like, I smelled you. I smelled you at the ceremony, but you weren't there. I wish you had been, so I could have chosen you as my mate. So It's like dancing the line and this is a thing that happens frequently in this series it's always dancing the line between rapey and like sexy and it doesn't always do it very well like sometimes it's like i'm like oh did he just say that to her with his mouth and she's like and sometimes i'm like okay that's that's kind of hot i guess but like ask first maybe so This is kind of when the tide starts to turn in the book and we start to see Feyre and Tamlin interacting with each other more. To this point, she's been like intrigued by him and interested in him, but she hasn't been willing to accept that side of herself. And that's something that you'll come across a lot with Feyre is that she is always the last one to know how she feels about something for some reason. I guess for plot reasons is the reason but it's just like oh my god girl we i figured out 100 pages ago that you were attracted to him why are you just figuring this out now (sighs) she's the most exhausting protagonist i have ever encountered and probably will ever encounter in a book series so yeah she's like always the last one to know how she feels about anything but her and tamlin start warming up to each other touching noses really close in the spring court garden and she's like oh my god I wish I knew what he looked like under that mask and she slowly starts to realize that she's developed feelings for him because I feel like at this point she's had feelings for him for a while it's there's a lot happening that's a little confusing for the reader if you don't know exactly what's going on she knows there's some her that Tamlin and Lucian and Alice and like everyone in the spring court is constantly referring to. She knows that there is some like evil magic that has been done on the land to cause everyone in the spring court to just constantly have to wear masks. And it's, it's kind of a retelling of Beauty and the Beast in that there's like invisible servants all over the place. And... Tamlin sometimes turns into a wolf monster when he's unable to control his emotions and like all of the trappings of Beauty and the Beast. So I knew that going in and I knew that there was some probably witch who had put 
a hex on the spring court at the end of the tunnel. But what I got just wasn't what I expected at all. And like I said earlier, you know, she had me in the first half. She did because I was intrigued. I was interested. I was enjoying myself as Tamlin and Feyre were starting to fall in love with each other. She was learning more about the fairy world, learning about like the monsters that live in the fairy world. So there's this thing called the adder that basically looks like skin and bones and is fucking evil and will rip anything to shreds for fun. And there's the um, surreal who can answer any question if you just capture it and all of this stuff, right? So I was like, ew, world building, love, romance. But then the big reveal comes and it just goes downhill from there. It just goes swiftly downhill from there. So basically we find out Resan comes back to Tamlin's court and he's like, just checking up on you, buddy. You know, the deadline is coming up real soon. It's been 49 years since you've been wearing those ridiculous masks. I hope you know what's about to happen. And Farrah's like, the deadline? What's going on? I don't understand. There's danger on the horizon, which they learn as soon as Reese comes to Tamlin's home. He asks Feyre what her name is and he has these like mind control powers. He can like go into people's brains. I don't know what that has to do with the night, but whatever. Um, He can go into people's brains and read their thoughts. And so she pulls the name Claire Better out of nowhere. And she's like, that's what my name is, whatever. And Tamlin realizes it's too dangerous for Feyre to stay, even though there's like a day, a week, a month, whatever, until the curse on the spring court is up. And some nebulous consequences are enacted upon the people of Prithian. So he says, for your safety, Feyre, I'm sending you back to the human world. I'm sending you back to your family. I know I told you that you were going to have to stay with me forever, but I don't care. I just don't want you to die. So Feyre goes back to her family and discovers that they're living basically in a castle. They're rich again all of a sudden. Her father's bad investment has been magically turned around and her sisters have no recollection of the fact that she was spirited away by a fairy. They're just like, oh my God, did you go see Aunt whatever the fuck? Like, how was that? She gets back to the human world and she's like, something about this doesn't feel right. Like, I don't feel like I belong here anymore. My family is rich again all of a sudden and I have to be a part of this like courtly drama. The setting of this place is very nebulous. Like there's sometimes when it feels like it's colonial America. Then there's other times when it feels like it's England. And then there's other times when it feels like it's like 1800s or not even like probably like 1600s France. Like it doesn't I don't really know where in the world this story is supposed to be set but i know that there's queens i know that there's courts the girls wear long dresses and all of that so just think about like the type of world of the 18th century and what women in the west would be how women in the west would be expected to comport themselves and then think about a bitch like katniss everdeen trying to survive in that world all of that to say, when Feyre goes back to her family, she feels really uncomfortable. She doesn't like know what her place is there. And also her relationship with her sister, Nesta, is fractitious. I think that's a word, fractitious. She discovers that her the glamour that Tamlin has put on her family didn't work on Nesta. And Nesta remembers everything. She remembers the fairies coming to take Feyre. She remembers her family being poor. She knows that they don't have some old sick aunt somewhere who left Feyre and the family a bunch of money. Like she is just a very tenacious person and a very spiteful person. And so she held on to those memories out of spite. And do you want to know what? She's my bitch for that alone because same. That's who I would be in this scenario. So she basically helps Feyre get back to the fairy world because Feyre knows something big is about to happen soon that is going to put Tamlin, Lucian, Alice, and everyone she loves over there at risk. She goes back to the fairy world because she knows that her friends are in trouble and she needs to be there to help in whatever way she can. The teeny tiny little human that she is with absolutely no strength or powers who just started having full, well-rounded meals about a year ago. She's really going to change the tide of everything. So she goes back to Tamlin's court and finds it in absolute ruin. Someone has come in and up through that bitch and ransacked everything. But she does also find Alice 
packing up all of her stuff, making herself a little plate so she can get the fuck out of there to safety with her um, two nephews. And Alice exposition dumps everything that has happened over the past 49 years and that happened in the like seven days that Feyre was gone. So we learn that there is an evil sorceress named Amarantha, a red haired bitch who is the general of the King of Highburn. And the King of Highburn is some amorphously evil guy. I don't know what his significance is, who he is, who his mama is, why I should be worried about him. But Sarah J. Ma said I should, so I am. And Amarantha is obsessed with Tamlin. She is in love with him. She wants him more than anything. But Tamlin said, no, 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 ma'am. I won't be having you. You won't. I, I will not be yours. And because of that, and dear God, Claire, please help. I get like, I literally don't. It, it literally came out. It came out in such like a thick dump of text that I only retained about 6% of what I read. Amarantha's character, like the only person in the world that she ever cared about was her sister who fell in love with a human named Jurian. But Jurian, there was like a bit, again, I don't know the details of this world building because I I couldn't separate it out from all of the rest of the stuff that was happening. Like there's a lot of amorphous globs surrounding the main plot of Feyre and Tamlin like falling in love and working together to break this curse. And I feel like that's a failure of the writing more so than it is a failure of anything else because like I should know who the King of Highburn is and why he matters. I should know who Amarantha is and why she matters. I should know I should understand who Jurian is and why he matters. Same thing with the war. I don't even know like why the war was happening, what the purpose of the war was, how I know how the war ended. There was a treaty that separated the humans from the fairies, but that's all I got. Jurian kills Clitoris because he tricked her because he was never really in love with her. He was actually in love with a human named Miriam, who I don't actually know if she was mentioned in this book, but I don't care. Um, and Amarantha wants to take vengeance on Jurian for killing the one person in the entire universe that she actually loved. So they battle for like days and days again one of them is a powerful fairy and the other one is a person. I don't really know how the battle for days and days happens, especially considering the way that the book ends, but whatever. Amarantha ends up winning and does not just kill Jurian. She slowly tortures him over several days, literally rips him limb from limb like every single one of his joints she makes a incision and basically like pulls him apart i'm thinking like achilles to hector after the trojan war he's like you killed patroclus i'm gonna cut out your tendons and your fucking calves string you up to the back of my chariot and drag you around the battlefield and at first, everyone's like, yeah. But then after a while, they're like, ew, dude, you have a rotten corpse in your tent. Like, that's really gross. Bury him. She takes his finger and his eyeball. She keeps his finger on a necklace and his eyeball with its sentience brain. He's still alive. His soul is still alive. And the eyeball is looking around on this little ring. I actually have an evil eye ring on my finger. Just imagine if that was a real human eyeball just looking at you. Just twizzling and turning and whipping and whirring around in there and thinking and feeling and seeing and all of that. She keeps those things on her person as a curse for Jurian for murdering her sister. And she also is really horny for Tamlin. So she just like wants Tamlin so bad. I don't know why that suddenly had to become everybody else's problem, but it did. Because Tamlin was like, um, no. I don't want this. And she was like, cool, that's totally fine. Hey, guys, want to have a party? So they throw a party at the spring court that's basically a masquerade. Everyone's wearing masks. And she tricks everyone into binding their powers to her. So like none of them have full 
access to their powers or they haven't had full access to their powers over the course of the book. And then she says, you have, she says, Tamlin, the only way for you to break this curse is if in 50 years you manage to convince a human woman who hates fairies to fall in love with you after killing a fairy. Why so specific? Once again, we'll never know. So she gives him this very specific assignment to break this curse after 50 years. We're basically at like 49 years and two months at the beginning of the book. And then over the course of the next nine and a half months, Tamlin and Feyre slowly fall in love and he sends her away right before the deadline is up. That's great for him and his people. And I don't exactly remember what the consequence of not breaking the curse is. I guess it's just that everyone is going to continue to be enslaved to Amarantha and they're never going to get their powers back. And the human, if he manages to find one, dies. So Feyre learns all of this when she returns to the spring court to see what she can do to help her friends and family out there. So Alice basically tells her, you were supposed to tell Tamlin that you loved him by the deadline. Like if you said the words, I love you to him, that would have broken the curse immediately. But since you couldn't do that, I guess you can go underneath of this mountain and see if you can find Amarantha's secret um, kingdom that she is operating down there and try and advocate for clemency for everyone. So it's supposed to take weeks and months and years to get to the kingdom under the mountain, but Alice magically knows of a shortcut. Why? I don't know. Through the shortcut, Feyre is able to find the court under the mountain that Amarantha is running with Tamlin by her side. And I'm pretty sure this again is like, I have such loose recollection. I have such loose recollection because so much happens in so little space, yet also nothing happens at the same time. Feyre finds Tamlin at Amarantha's side. And for some reason, he still like won't go for Amarantha. But she's just like keeping him there in case he changes his mind at some point. Oh, and the other thing that I forgot about this this whole time is that Reese is sleeping with Amarantha. He is called the witch's whore. He's basically like her little plaything, and she can do whatever she wants with him. And it's for a position of influence for the night court. Feyre gets under the mountain. She's talking to Amarantha, the adder that I mentioned before, like brings her in front of Amarantha and Amarantha's like, y'all miss the deadline, but that's so fine. I have so much faith in my all encompassing power that I'm going to give you this opportunity. You can either answer a riddle that I'm going to present to you or you can go through three trials. And upon the successful completion of the trials, I will free everyone here. But if you answer the riddle successfully, I'll free everyone right now, immediately. Everyone will be free immediately. So you can either pick the trials and I'll free everyone, or you can pick the riddle and I'll free everyone immediately. So the thing about fairies that remains constant in this book is that they're very tricky. There's a lot of lore about fairies that for some reason or or another, Sarah J. Maas has decided doesn't count. So she is like, no, fairies can lie. It's it reminds me a lot of Twilight, actually. There's that whole thing in Twilight where Ella asks Edward, she's like, you you basically learn the real the quote unquote real lore of vampires they don't really burn up in the sun they just like turn super sparkly no their hearts don't beat yes they are cold to the touch but they're also rock solid so you can't like kill them by staking them in the heart the only way to kill them is by ripping them to shreds and burning the body i feel like all of that in twilight functions to make the vampires to strip vampires basically of their demonic origins because a vampire is literally a demon possessing a human's body that does retain it's like a parasitic um infection the human retains its personality mental characteristics all of that but the vampire is the demon that is driving the human to drink blood and all of this and because stephanie meyer is mormon she's like drinking blood blood is like their original sin or drinking human blood is like their original sin but they can evade it and um they can avoid 
committing that sin by choosing instead to be vegetarian like there's all of these vegetarian as in eat drinking animal blood there's all of these ways that she is stripping the vampire of its demonic origin in order to i guess reconcile its lore as a mormon woman like something that burns up in the sun and gets burned by holy water can't touch crosses all of that it's because there's a demon living inside of it but if it's just like sparkly and you can go to church and touch as many crucifixes as you want because it's not going to have any impact on you that's not a demon that's just like a superhuman that happens to subsist off of drinking blood very similar with the fairies in a court of in the a court of thorns and roses series they can lie they are are susceptible to ash but they are not susceptible to iron and there's a bunch of like other stuff they're not twilight creatures like they are in other lore it's not the traditional sense of a fairy what she does retain is this idea of them being tricksters then it just kind of neuters them and makes them at least the high fae to me feel like less interesting because they're not these mythological characters with these attributes that make them distinctive they're pretty much just like humans they're like superheroes they're like humans with superpowers and big dicks like that's that's really the only thing that is distinctive about the high fae and like gray morals whereas humans are more like moralistic figures the high fae are not i say all that to say Feyre knows that Amarantha is going to be tricky in some way. So she's listening to this proposal that she's giving and she's like, mm, should I go with this? Should I not go with this? Ooh, I don't know. But she's like, okay, I'll take your deal. I will do the three trials. And Amarantha is basically like, at any point, if you can figure out the answer to this riddle, then you can, then everyone will be free immediately. So let me, let me just pull up. Let me just pull up Amarantha's riddle so we can all go over it together and see if we can get see if we can glean the answer to this riddle together okay so i actually i actually am gonna pump the brakes i'm not gonna go to amarantha's riddle first because i feel like that'll that'll take some of the that'll take some of the air out of this let's let's start with the trials that Feyre goes through because she cannot figure out the answer to this riddle so the kind of unspoken trial is that Feyre is basically enslaved under the mountain she is imprisoned um i'm pretty sure she has to like sleep on the floor with barely any clothes she's dirty she has to clean up after everyone she's like cleaning something and then um people will come and help her and heal her or whatever and then her first trial is the midgard worm the Middengard worm is this big, gross worm. Basically, think about the think about the Alaskan bullworm from SpongeBob. But um, no, yeah, just think about the Alaskan bullworm from SpongeBob. It's basically just that enti- the entire plot of that episode of SpongeBob. And she goes into this maze, and she has to not get eaten by the worm and also kill the worm. Wow she's in this big gross muddy maze full of dead things and bones and oh it's really disgusting there's a lot of like gross body horror in the second half of this book that i was not prepared for by the first half of this book so i could i i could throw up but she's running around this maze trying to get away from this worm and i will give sarah this like the pacing and the um climactic moments in this scene are very gripping because you want her to be able to get away but like you don't want her to get away super clean you know so she running 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 trying to to get away from the worm and also trying to kill the worm and she's like i'm way too small (laughs) this worm is going to eat me for breakfast but she devises this plan basically to she like falls down a hole she devises this plan to take some of the bones of the creatures that are dead in this hole and stick them up like like shivs and then use the other bones as a ladder to climb up out of the hole and so she's basically going to trick the worm into sliding down into the hole to try and get her 
and then impale the worm while she is able to escape. So she does that and she wins the first trial because she's impaled the worm on the bones of its own prey. I think before this, she had had her nose broken by the adder and Lucian healed her. And so Amarantha was like really mad at him for healing her. And but she like asked Pharaoh for some reason, like, did he heal you? And Pharaoh's like, no. So she basically saved Lucian's life. After the trial with the midden guard worm, she's waiting for Lucian to come back and heal her again. But he can't get away because now he has like a target on his back. So instead, Reese, the high lord of the autumn court, comes down to the dungeons and he's like, I will heal you if you promise to come and stay with me one week out of think every month for the rest of your life. This is problematic because she's in love with Tamlin. Tamlin and Reese are rivals. They hate each other. They are not friends and we don't really learn why that is until later. She's She tries to say no, but she actually doesn't really have a leg to stand on. Like there's no choice here really. And that's going to come in later, unfortunately. There's no choice here really because she's either going to die of the fever that she has from an infected broken bone or she's going to get healed by Reese. So she's like, yeah, sure, whatever. I'll come stay with you for one week out of every month for the rest of my life if you just make it so I don't die before I can help all of the fairy folk. So he heals her. She is sealed into this bond with him. And he, as, a, as an emblem of the bond, he covers her in these tattoos that are emblematic of the night court. Then she is forever marked as his. This would seem like it would be bad because Reese is Amarantha's consort, but Amarantha is in love with Tamlin. So if she doesn't really care about Reese. She just is like using him and abusing him. But if the human that is supposed to be in love with Tamlin is occupied with Reese, then Amarantha can go ahead and have Tamlin for herself, right? So she's like a little bit wary about about Feyre being attached to Reese, but she doesn't really like see through the ruse. So she continues and it becomes a point of contention between Tamlin and Feyre again because Tamlin and Reese are rivals. They super hate each other for reasons that we don't know about yet. And Tamlin is like, I can't believe that you or I guess Lucian is the one who's allowed to say this because Tamlin can't really see Feyre because if they're alone together, if it seems like he is as in love with her as she is with him, then Amarantha will end them both pretty much. So Lucian is like, I can't believe that you shackled yourself to him this way. Like you are going to be indebted to him forever. It's not easy to break a bond, a magical bond made with a fairy. Like once you make a promise, once a fairy makes a promise, they have to fulfill it. Or once and once a human makes a bargain with a fairy, they have to fulfill it. But again, she really had no other choice. She was pretty much going to die. That is the first trial. There's a lot of other stuff that happens under the mountain that I guess I wasn't expecting to happen. I guess I thought that it would be like a succession of trials, but it's actually a lot more like the labors of Hercules. Like a trial happens and then there's some off time and then another one happens and then there's some off time. It's it's like that. She There's some off time in between the first and the second trial where she's forced to to try and like pick lentils out of the fire pit of or she has to she has to clean the floor of the great hall of amaranthas under the mountain castle but she's given dirty water and if the floor isn't spotless then she's going to be beaten within an inch of her life so lucian's mom comes down and cleans the water for her basically as a thanks for her saving lucian's life in front of amarantha so that's one way that it's clear that a lot of the fairies are on it's clear that a lot of the fairies are on Feyre's side. They just kind of can't be that open about it because if they are, then Amarantha will literally end them in the most horrible way possible. So she's getting a lot of secret help from fairies while she's under the mountain. But there's also parties happening while she's under the mountain. So Reese gives her fairy wine and fairy wine has this ability to make humans completely loopy and just like not really be able to remember so he like makes her dress up in pretty much nothing like gauze like gauze with some underwear on underneath and she has to like dance for him and on him and sit in his lap and all of this in front of Tamlin as a way for Reese to taunt Tamlin because Tamlin is in love with Feyre. Feyre is in love with Tamlin, but Reese kind of owns her because he helped her after her trial. That's occurring 
and then the second trial comes. The second trial, Feyre, because Lucian helped Feyre that one time, but Amarantha wasn't able to prove it, she punishes them both by giving Feyre, I think, a riddle or something to read and decipher on the wall, but she can't read it. And so if she's not able to decipher the riddle, then she and Lucian will both be crushed by spikes. Think Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm pretty sure that's when that happens. I was going to give you more details than that, but they really don't matter. Just suffice to say she figures it out eventually, but it really shakes her because this is a moment where her inability to read has actually like come and almost killed her. And I'll say this several times throughout this video, probably. I think Feyre is not smart. There's nothing going on up there. It's just a vast expanse of wind blowing straight between her ears. But one thing I will say, it's not because she's illiterate. It's not because she's illiterate. There's a lot of people who read books every day. Nothing going on in the head. There's a lot of people who've never learned how to read in their lives. Geniuses. Super smart. Street, there's so many different ways to be intelligent. You know, street smarts. Um, social smarts, book smarts, all of that. Feyre lacks every single one of those. She's, it's just vibes with her. Like it's literally just vibes. It's as if, it's reading as if the main character was an inanimate object that liked to paint and also had a lot of sex. Think of it that way. She, she's shook. By the second trial, I wish I could say I was. The third trial comes. A lot about again, a bunch of stuff happens. Her and Reese end up making out because she was like making whoopee with Tamlin under the mountain, and Amarantha was about to catch them. And Reese is like, "You stupid bitch! Like, why the fuck were you making out with him when you know what would happen if you got caught?" He kisses her instead, and she's like. Oh, that was so gross, but maybe it wasn't. And then we get to the third trial. The third trial involves Feyre having to either answer the riddle or stab three fairies in the heart and kill them. We're revisiting the riddle now because this is the only thing standing between the fairies and freedom is this riddle. Let me just set the scene. This is a riddle given to Feyre by a woman who committed gruesome murder because her, the only person she ever loved was betrayed and killed. This is a riddle given to Feyre by a woman who has neutered and enslaved an entire population of fairies because the one man that she loves doesn't want to be with her. This is a riddle given by Feyre, given to Feyre by a woman who gave someone the task, basically, of breaking the curse put on them by getting someone who's supposed to hate them to fall in love with them. So all of that being said, let's read the riddle together, shall we? <sighs> there are those who seek me a lifetime, but we never meet, and those I kiss, but who trample me beneath ungrateful feet. At times I seem to favor the clever and the fair, but I bless all those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft-handed and sweet, but scorned I become difficult, a difficult beast to defeat. For though each of my strikes lands a powerful blow, when I kill, I do it slow. Now, before each of her trials, Feyre is presented with this riddle, and she's like, oh, shucks, you just can't figure it out. The second I read, the, how many lines? Those four couplets? I said the answer's love. The answer is love. What has this bitch been obsessed with this entire time? Love. Every kind of love. Turning love to hate. Familial love. Romantic love. Sexual love. Love of power. Love. Love is the only thing motivating Amarantha. And what does Feyre say each time she's presented with the riddle? Mm, I just can't figure it out. This is why I say she's not smart. This is why I say there's nothing going on up there. Because anyone who thinks, anyone who thinks would have figured that out almost immediately. I cannot tell you the amount of Reddit threads that I've seen of people being like, really? That's the answer to the riddle? But anyways, Feyre 
is presented with this a third time and she's like i still can't figure it out so she stabs two fairies in the heart and it's really hard for her and she's really sad about it she kills the first one because she's like and he's like begging for his life and then she kills the second one and the second one is like it's okay i know this is to free all of prithian i'll be all right and then the third one is tamlin now amarantha is not expecting pharaoh to stab tamlin in the heart and there have been hints dropped throughout the book that part of Tamlin's curse is that his heart is literally turned to stone. And she finally puts all of these hints together and is able to glean that Tamlin's heart is literally made of stone. And so when she stabs him, the knife chips and she's basically able to complete all the trials because Amarantha assumed that she would never stab Tamlin in the heart and she did she the 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 third trial was to stab three people she stabbed all of them so the curse should be broken right Amarantha said she would free the people of Prithian when Feyre completed the trials she never said when she would free the people of Prithian and so Rather than accept her defeat at the hands of a lowly human that the man that she's obsessed with is in love with, she, she breaks almost every bone in Feyre's body and very slowly kills her while Feyre's, the, the friends and loved ones she's been able to amass under the mountain, watch this was difficult for me to read because again i hate body horror and it kind of felt like the body horror just like came out of nowhere i was like what the fuck why are we breaking bones and why is it bone sticking out all of a sudden like oh i hate that but some of the key things that happen during this scene is that reese tries to pick up a knife and kill amarantha because he's basically he says this when he's kissing Feyre in the closet and he never needed to say this to her and he reiterates it again like makes it very clear to her i'm not actually on amarantha's side i only sleep with her so that i can get so that i can make sure that i protect the people of the night court and i think you're actually really cool and i think it's cool that you're doing this trying to save the people of prithian and i'm sorry that i had to pretend like i hated you but i just want my powers back and i want my world back and i want amarantha defeated like he's he makes that very clear and that's basically the thing with every sarah j moss book you will never have to guess what a character's motivations are because at some point in this series they will get on a soapbox and loudly proclaim those motivations to you so reese gets up and charges at amarantha with a knife he isn't able to defeat her because everyone in the room is weakened by the spell that she puts on and amarantha is actively killing Feyre, but by right before the killing blow hits Feyre is able to figure out that the answer to the riddle is love right before her neck snaps and she's tethered to the earth still through her bond with reese she's like bonded to reese through these tattoos that are on her body she like starts to see the world through his eyes because of their bond and so she sees that like saying that the answer is love has broken the curse tamlin is free reese is free everyone gets all their powers back and amaranth is basically running scared because really the only way that she was able to take over prithian and declare herself high queen of prithian which there isn't supposed to be a high queen of Prithian because there's high lords of different courts of Prithian was by basically like injuring everyone and making it so that their powers weren't at 100% capacity. But now with their powers back at 100% capacity, Tamlin kills Amarantha pretty quickly and all of the high lords of Prithian, the high lord of autumn, spring, summer, winter, night, day, and dawn come together and put a little drop of their power into Feyre to turn her into a fairy and bring her back to life. And that's pretty much the book. That's like pretty much the first book. They like bring her back to life and now she is high fey and she's like, oh my god, this new body. She was like on the brink of death, about to die, but she was still tethered to Reese. And because of that tether that she had to Reese, they were able to bring her back to life. And that's that's pretty much the entirety of the first book. It only took me almost an hour and a half to get through that entire thing. Like she really had me in the first half. Like the parts where Tamlin and Feyre are like slowly falling in love and all of that and like running around the spring court and holding hands and cute, cute, cute. 
those parts have a very special place in my heart because I just thought that it was adorable. Like I thought that the progression of their relationship was really cute and believable, even though it all started out with a lie and ended up being a lie. But like, we didn't know that yet. Once she went back to the human world, I, she kind of lost me. I wanted to know what was happening and that's what continued to propel me through the book. But it was no longer about enjoyable, about being an enjoyable reading experience. And it was more so just about me like desperately needing to understand where this was going to end up. I know a lot of people probably really loved the trials section of the book. That was my least favorite part of the entire book because in the end we all know where it's going like there's more than one book in this series we all know that she's going to survive some way i mean granted she did fully die like in the most gruesome way possible so like yeah there's stakes in that but she's gonna survive the trials she's gonna get healed at the end of the trials there was no stakes in the riddle because I immediately knew what the answer was and I was mostly just frustrated that she couldn't figure it out herself like there's so many things in this book that she can't figure out she can't figure out that the person standing outside the window isn't really her dad because how the fuck would her dad have gotten all the way through the forest to stand under her window and tell her to come with him she can't figure out that she's not supposed to go outside on a night of fairy romping and fun. She doesn't figure out that the night bitch who's been mean to her twice is actually really on her side because he wants to be freed from this evil queen who stole his powers. She doesn't figure out that she's in love with Tamlin until it's too late. Like all of these things that we the audience know and not because it's like sometimes the audience knows things because it's from a third person omniscient perspective and so we are able to see things that the characters can't see no we're in her mind we're in her brain we're in her perspective and still we're looking at the world around her like well i know what that is i know what that is i know what that is and she's like not putting two and two together very frustrating it's very frustrating and she reminds me of katniss everdeen in that way too because katniss constantly throughout the hunger games looking around like damn i wish i knew what was going on I know what's going on. Jump out of the book and ask me because I could tell you. Granted, there were some times when I was gagged. She did goop me at times, Miss Suzanne Collins. But other times I just was like, you're in love with Peta. What are you doing with Gail? Clearly they're coming up with some plan to escape the Hunger Games, the 75th Hunger Games. Just go along with it. Like, what's, it's just like, it's like, what it, it's like, what's not clicking? What's not clicking? What's not clear to you? Narrative requires the main character to be in a level of obscurity and confusion in order to maintain the air of mystery. But when the only person who doesn't know what's going on is the main character, it's really frustrating. Because like in the prose, there's no mystery. In the story, there's no mystery. It's clear from the moment that Rhysand looks at her that he is like, ooh, she's cute. It's clear from the moment that she gets to the house that Tamlin is trying to get her to fall in love with him. Like, it's clear from the moment we read the riddle that the riddle, the answer to the riddle is love. It's clear from the moment that the trials start that she's gonna beat them. So much stuff that's so obvious to me as a reader that is supposed to be like a source of suspense and just isn't. <sighs> that is the first book. I don't know if I should make the second book a second video. I guess I should, but I don't really want to. I'm going to be honest, I went into this book really, really wanting to like it. And I did enjoy like the 10% to 68% mark in the book. That solid 58% chunk. I was having a good time. I was enjoying the pacing, the story development, the character development, all of that. I was almost immediately lost when the stakesless, undeveloped villain appeared. And I was like, who is this bitch? And what is she supposed to mean to me? She means nothing to me. It's very exhausting. And then I, we had to spend the entire end of the book dealing with Amarantha and the fallout of Amarantha. I don't have suggestions for how this book could have been better because it's out there, you know, it's been made. A lot of people clearly love it. It's got a 4.2 on Goodreads, which 
is it crack that you smoke because i would like some but yeah that is a court of thorns and roses i'm going to probably come to you at some point in the future with my review of a court of mist and fury just because i finished that book recently and the rage the rage that i felt if i thought the first one was bad when we get into the second one but yes thank you so much for watching this video i know there's probably a lot of other reviews synopses of this this series that you could be watching but i appreciate you being here with me i've had too much wine so i'm just gonna leave it there and i'll see you again probably in this exact same outfit for a court of mist and fury Thank you.